a pleasure to introduce Sri Panja, who will talk on an um, update on physical therapy and exercise recommendation. Thank you, Sri. Um, thank you, Dan. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Dan and his mom, Carol, for a long time and working with the society for a long, long time. Um, I did not have a slide like the others did about my colleagues um, and the source of funding. Um, so I'm just going to go back and uh, say that I want to take this opportunity um, to acknowledge everyone that I've worked with over the last 30 years. I've been at the University of Rochester since 1980 and I've had the privilege uh, to work with some of the major uh, forces in neuromuscular disorders, Dr. Griggs, Dr. Moxley, Dr. Tavell, and also uh, across the world, uh, the folks at Leiden, we've had a partnership with Silvere and Dr. Padberg and others for many, many years, and really, when I stand before you, what I bring to you is what I have learned over those 30 years. And definitely not the least, but for me, the most important group of people that have contributed to my knowledge and growth personally so that I can help you are the patients and families that I have worked with. Because each time I speak to one of you, each time I get an email from one of you, each time I see one of you in clinic, each time I evaluate one of you for research, um, I learn something new each day. And that would be hard to put on a slide, all the faces and people that have contributed to my learning. So I just want to acknowledge that now. So in 2007, the FSH Society gave us a grant uh, to develop this little guide, and I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to use it. I hope you have, uh, because we were finding that uh, people would say to us, you know, it's so hard to find doctors or physical therapists who know about FSH, and you know, they treat us like we have an orthopedic problem, a rotator cuff injury, and I'm not sure that what they're telling us is the right thing to do. And that's when the FSH Society funded us, uh, Wendy King at Ohio State and I, to develop this little guide mainly to assist physical therapists and patients develop an individualized plan of care. We felt that it was essential that yes, there would be a broad outline and guidance, but really, as, as you can see here, each one of you is an individual. Each of you is at a different stage in life, different stage in your disorder, have different issues, personal factors, family factors, work factors. And, and so to say that, you know, this is the program for every person with FSH would be silly. We have to take a holistic approach and look at what, what is the right mix of things for every individual and help develop a plan. So that was basically the goal of the guide. And, and I'm going to move this a little so I can look at the slides right here. Um, so we really wanted to develop something that was based on best research evidence clinician expertise, and patient references. And much of the information in that guide is still very, very pertinent. But, you know, that was 2007, and, and as you've heard over the last day, so much has happened since then. And what the decision was made uh, last year that we need to update the guide, and I'm working on that right now. Actually, the booklet part is done, and what we want to do is now include the current knowledge of genetics, so include FSHD type 2 that we didn't talk about in the guide, talk about a better understanding of the DUCS4, and I realize that it's a moving target, and you know, each day a new discovery happens and, and a new paper comes out and we need to sort of uh, reference it. Much has happened in the world of exercise and physical activity recommendations. Just, I mean, we heard new information from Dr. Van Engelen this morning. 
Um, so we are trying to incorporate and update all this information in the guide. And the second thing we've decided is to add short video clips so that when we talk about range of motion exercises, what exactly are we talking about? What does it mean? So that it, it, it becomes a little more helpful for patients and families and therapists who are going to use this guide. So stay tuned for it the plan is to have it all out before the end of the year and hopefully you will find it interesting and helpful and we would love to get feedback on what more we can add to it so for today really the goals of the presentation for today is to discuss the pertinent information from the guide and then provide some additional information that we are going to use in the updated guide and these recommendations are mainly based on consensus and some research evidence. As Dr. Van Engelen pointed out, you know, the gold standard is the randomized control trials. But there are very few randomized control trials in terms of physical activity or exercise or diet and all those things. So really a lot of the recommendations either come from what is being recommended for the general population next what is being recommended for the general muscular dystrophy population and then within the fsh population so what are the goals of physical therapy as a physical therapist when i meet a patient and, and it doesn't matter to me if it's a patient with fsh or a muscular dystrophy or stroke irrespective of the condition, our goals are to maintain optimum health and wellness. We take a holistic approach to this. We know that there can be secondary complications because of, the, of your primary disorder. So we want to try and delay or prevent these secondary complications as much as possible. We want to make sure that we are able to help help guide you to maximize your functional abilities. Yes, you have a muscle disorder. Yes, you have weakness. Yes, it puts limitations on what you can do. But together, can we come up with solutions to maximize your functional abilities? And those solutions might be an assistive device, change of your physical environment, a little change in your routine. There are lots of things we can do to improve or maximize your functional abilities. And I think this then helps improve and maintain the quality of life. And to me, that's the most important thing. Your quality of life and your role function, whether it is that of a parent, grandparent, uncle, aunt, are you able to do the things that you really want to do that are important to you? Are you able to you know, go out with your friends? Whatever it is that's important in your life. We want to try and do that. Now, as I said before, I truly believe that this requires an individualized plan based on you know, your individual factors. And this plan may include uh, guidance about appropriate activities and exercise. If pain and fatigue are a huge issue, then we need to address that. And it may also include, as I said, orthotics, mobility, and assistive devices to make life easier. Now, we all know that over the past several decades, the, the benefits of phys physical activity in the general population have been well documented. We know that it helps us control and lose weight. It re reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease, reduces risk of diabetes, reduces risk of some types of cancer, helps strengthen bone and muscles. It has an impact on our mental health and mood. And it increases our ability to do daily activities. And some studies have also shown that it increases chance of living longer. So based on this evidence, in 2008, the CDC put out an activity guideline for Americans. And if you just Google physical activity guidelines, it'll bring you to this website. And what it does is basically makes recommendations for the general population. And it talks about high intensity, moderate intensity levels. And what I have chosen to do 
here today is only to talk about moderate intensity. Because one of the things we do know, based on all the studies that have been done in muscular dystrophy, is really people are still very wary of high intensity aerobic or strengthening activities. If you're going to do anything, it has to be in the moderate or lower level, again, depending on, on where you are in your disease stage. So what are the current physical activity guidelines? It says two hours and 30 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise every week. So that means 150 minutes. You can spread your activity out during the week. So you may choose to do 30 minutes five times a day, five days a week, not five times a day. Um, and recently they have even said that you know you could even break it up into chunks of 10 minutes at a time. It does not have to be 30 minutes. And I think more and more the data shows the problems with inactivity and setting. So just even getting up and walking and going to the water cooler or going to the mail room or instead of sending an email to the person in the next cubicle, walking over and talking to them is good for your health, okay? So, and again, as I think Dr. England said, you know, instead of taking the elevator, if you are able to walk up and down the stairs, take the flight up of stairs, one flight of stairs, instead of standing, button pressed, waiting for the elevator. Weave in physical activity into your daily routine as much as you can, rather than, you know, thinking that, Exercise and activity are only good for you if you put on your gym clothes and go to a gym and work out there. Yes, there are definitely benefits to that, but there are also benefits to just weaving it into your daily routines. Now, moderate intensity activities and exercise, what are they? When we get technical, we might talk about it in terms of heart rate, VO2 max, and again, as Dr. Anglin said earlier this morning, 50 to 70 percent is the range that we go for. Well, there's a very simple definition. Yes, you can now get monitors that you can sl slap on your wrist, and you know, things have become a lot easier if that's how we want to go about it and be a little formal, but the simplest definition of moderate intensity activities are those where you can still carry on a conversation while you're doing that activity so that you're not huffing and puffing so much and you're not so out of breath that you can't talk to the person that you're exercising with or walking with or dancing with or whatever it is that you're doing. And again, you know, I would recommend that weave things into your daily activities, especially if you live in, in the Northeast. Mowing, raking, snow, all those things that you have to deal with are all activities, if you can participate in, are wonderful things to do. Mm -hmm.